I've spent the past months on and off designing coil guns, and I've gotten decently far. The latest design was pretty much finalized, so much so that I ordered parts for it. I got the circuit boards, I bought the rather expensive MOSFETs to drive the whole system, and I even got the massive battery to power it all. But I'm still unhappy with it. I do think that I'm capable of making a coil gun. The design would have worked, or at least I would have expected it to work. The issue is, I don't think it would work well enough. And my goal here was not just to build a coil gun. It was to build an efficient coil gun. That's the whole purpose. And I don't think that the latest design would do that. I don't think it would be efficient. So I do not plan on building the latest design. I also do not plan on making a new design, or at least not right now. Having put all this time into this project, I now understand the system and the parameters better than I ever have. What I'm realizing is that in order to do this project justice, the coil gun requires fundamental changes. I'm also realizing that I am severely under-equipped to take on a project of this magnitude. The main thing is, I don't have an oscilloscope, which is like the fundamental tool of working on electronics. An oscilloscope would allow me to directly view the voltage and waveforms that the system generated. Without an oscilloscope, I'm really just guessing on what I think is happening. The thing with electronics is you're dealing with primarily invisible forces. You can't see electricity, you can't see magnetic fields. An oscilloscope allows you to see some of that so you can actually figure out what's happening. They're super precise, they take a ton of data, they're generally in the range of giga samples per second, that is over a billion samples in one second. And that's the kind of speed that you need to work with most electronics. The issue is that kind of accuracy and speed uh, takes a lot of money, and that's money that I don't have for it. So what this means is that without an oscilloscope, if the coil gun doesn't work, I couldn't tell you why. I couldn't actually see what's happening. Even if it did work, I couldn't tell you why it was working, because again, I couldn't see what's happening on the inside. And it was admittedly naive of me to think that I would be able to do this without the proper testing equipment. So what am I saying? I'm saying that I'm dropping the Quilgan project. I am not properly equipped to work on it. And having spent all this time in it, I know better now than I have ever that my past designs would in no way hold their own. This is not to say that I won't work on coil guns again. I certainly will. Coil guns are super cool. And I do still believe that it is possible to get an efficient coil gun, just not in the way that I've been trying to do it. Not, not at all. And I don't have an oscilloscope now, but I certainly will in the future. That is not a question. So once I do get that oscilloscope and I get more familiar with it and I get more inspiration for the coil gun project, I will certainly return to it and I'll try and do the project justice as it deserves. But before I set this project aside, I have some final thoughts and there's some misleading things that I've said in the past that I'd like to clarify. So if you've been following along, you'll know that coil guns are extremely inefficient and that I've proposed a few ways that I think might be able to increase that efficiency. One of the main things I proposed was the elimination of capacitors and instead deriving the system directly from a power source. Capacitors are a really good way to store a lot of energy and then release them quickly, so yeah, they seem like they'd be the perfect fit for a coil gun, which needs to do exactly that. But I suggested that the way in which they discharge was inherently undesirable, and that was contributing to the inefficiency. What I was referring to was the voltage discharge curve of a capacitor. So this is my graph, and the x-axis represents time, and the y-axis represents voltage. If you were to put a load across the capacitor, the voltage would decrease and it would look like that. And I believe this curve is represented by e to the negative x. Now my thought was, if this is how a capacitor discharges, this surely is not desirable for a coil gun. Your goal is to smoothly accelerate a projectile, except this is not very smooth. What I mean is that you would have an initial current spike at the very beginning, and then it would very quickly drop off to almost nothing. It doesn't seem ideal at all. I was right, but I was mostly wrong. This is certainly how a capacitor discharges, except only when you have a resistive load. This would be like a capacitor and a resistor in series. Except that's not what a coil gun would be. A coil gun would be an LCR circuit. That is to say, a capacitor and a resistor and an inductor in series. And when you incorporate inductance into the equation, this no longer holds. It becomes radically different. So if I make a new graph here, my x-axis is still going to be time. My y-axis is going to be amperage this time. 
and this is amperage across the inductor, which at the end of the day is the only thing that we care about. So what happens when I incorporate inductance into the equation? Well, something really cool happens. The current across an inductor will start at zero, which would happen if there was a capacitor there or not, and then it'll rise to some peak value, and then it'll come back down, as you'd expect, but then it'll go past zero. It'll go negative and back up and do something like that. What you get is a sine wave oscillation. If this were a perfect system with no resistance whatsoever, this would continue to oscillate forever. So we do of course live in the real world, so there is resistance. It'll lose energy over time and the current will go to zero eventually. So this is what I thought it would do. This is what it would actually do. This is super different. And coincidentally, I think this is also super helpful. If you know anything about electronics, you know that sine waves are everywhere. And there's a reason for that. These sine waves, they show up naturally, and they're really good at inducing uh, magnetic fields and things like that. But generally, sine waves are really helpful, especially when you're trying to move something. Think of a BLDC motor, a brushless DC motor. Generally, small BLDC motors are in a Y configuration. They have three outputs, there, there, and there. And then when you run current, it runs through here, or through here, or through here and you drive a BLDC motor with three-phase sinusoidal AC. So again, sine wave showing up. And in order to make the motor efficient, it has to be a sine wave. You can talk about the theory and the math behind that all you want, but you don't need to. You can just look at what it wants to do itself. Here's what I mean. If you wire up your oscilloscope to the three outputs across a BLDC motor, you measure the voltage over time, and then you just spin the motor. When you spin up that motor, the changing magnetic fields from the permanent magnets will create current across the per electromagnets, and that will create a waveform. So when you use a BLDC motor as a generator like that, it will create three-phase sinusoidal AC. And these types of things, they work forwards and backwards. So if I spin it, it creates AC. If I put AC current into it, it'll spin, and it turns out that that method is the best way to get an efficient energy transfer. A coil gun is effectively just a linear motor, kind of just unrolling a BLDC motor and trying to make it run super quickly. So now instead of thinking about what you would get on the output if you were to spin a BLDC motor, let's think about what you would get on the output of a coil gun if you were to drop your projectile through it, which is to say you were accelerating the projectile through it because of gravity. If I just held the barrel vertically and I dropped my steel ferromagnetic projectile through it, I wouldn't see anything happen to the coils because there's no magnetic fields there. So nothing, no current is being generated. But if I were to instead drop a magnet through it, there would be um, magnetic fields and I would see current across all of the individual coils. What I would expect to see is a sine wave, specifically one full period, I, I think. So then if your projectile was a permanent magnet, I would expect that you would want to drive it with one full period of a sine wave in each coil, which makes sense. The uh, positive current would be pulling the projectile into it, and then the negative current would be pushing it out the end. But my point is, I originally said no capacitors, capacitors are bad because of this. This is not right. Capacitors can be used properly to produce this oscillation, making what is really close to a sine wave. It's not quite a perfect sine wave because of that dampening, but I think this is how you get that higher efficiency. Granted, I do think you'd have to cut it off here, but that's fine. This is still problematic though. This kind of oscillation happens with things like ceramic capacitors. That is to say, capacitors that can take voltage in either direction. A normal electrolytic capacitor, which is what can store these high amounts of energy, they can't go both ways. They can only go positive. So this negative voltage here could be fatal to the capacitors. So I'm not totally sure how you fix that. I'm sure there's a solution. Maybe you only need the one side. I don't know. But I'm not saying just use capacitors. What I mean to say is use the right capacitors. The waveform does not always look like this, this oscillation. Here is another graph. Again, we'll have time over here and amperage over here. It's also possible for my LCR circuit to look more like this. The current across my inductor would still start at zero, it would go to some maximum, and then it would level off like that. This oscillation has been fully dampened, so it doesn't go negative. 
So this does start out like a sine wave, but clearly it's not. So I don't think this is desirable. How do you differentiate between these two? Well, that has to do with the uh, relative magnitudes of your capacitance and your inductance. One of the biggest things I struggled with with the latest coil gun design was determining how many windings of the coil. And it ended up just relying on resistance. What I'm thinking now is that the coil should be wound specifically to get exact inductances to work with your exact capacitors. So not only the proper inductance and capacitance relationship to be able to get this sinusoidal oscillation, but also the correct relationship to control the width of, of this sine wave. Presumably you want to make the length of a single period the approximate length that the uh, projectile will be inside the barrel. If you can do that, then everything will line up perfectly. So that's going to require some fine tuning of your, of your inductance. So my new proposition is do use capacitors and very importantly, do the math to come up with the correct relationship between capacitance and inductance of your coil so you can get the proper period of your, your oscillation. But there's another thing, probably an equally important thing. This doesn't really work with the existing projectile. The standard projectile is just a ferromagnetic bar, so like a steel rod. The thing with ferromagnetic materials is that you can pull them with an electromagnet, but that's it, you can't do any pushing. And I'll remind you that this negative voltage would be intended to push the projectile. That doesn't work. That doesn't mean scrap this idea. What that means is rethink the projectile material. One of the proposed reasons that coil guns are so inefficient is because of magnetic saturation. And that is a property specifically of ferromagnetic materials. The idea is that if I have a magnet and this magnetic material, they'll stick together. If I increase the strength of my magnet, then they'll stick together even more. But there comes a point where the material is fully saturated, when it reaches, reaches the point of magnetic saturation, um, that any bigger magnet will not pull on the material anymore. The projectile in a coil gun is pretty small and you're running a ton of current through a really big coil. So that magnetic, the magnetic field of the coil is probably oversaturating the, uh, the projectile, which is to say that you're losing a bunch of energy, that you're not creating the maximum amount of force. This is a super valid point. It makes a ton of sense. But is there anything that we can use other than a ferromagnetic projectile? And there is, there certainly is. The easy solution is just to use a permanent magnet for your projectile. That would work wonderfully with this, but that kind of defeats the purpose of a coil gun. One of the many beauties of a coil gun is that the ammunition is extremely inexpensive. It's literally just a steel rod, that's it. Permanent magnets are a whole lot more expensive. It also means that you would want higher grade permanent magnets for a higher velocity, which gets even more expensive. And then you have to have them in the proper shape. You can't just like grind down a magnet to be the rod shape that you want. It's a, it will be a whole ordeal. Is there another option? We want a projectile that can create a magnetic field because then we don't have to worry about saturation. Because if I have two magnets that are pushing each other and I make one stronger, yeah, the force is going to be, the forces between them are going to be greater but I can make that other magnet infinitely greater and the forces will continue to rise infinitely. There's no saturation point because you're not manipulating magnetic domains like you are in a ferromagnetic material. You're just increasing the force. So what projectile would have a magnetic field around it that would not be a permanent magnet? Well, the only other option would be some sort of electromagnet. But how do you get an electromagnet in there? You can't power the projectile that'd be crazy and again expensive. I mentioned earlier that these sinusoidal ray forms are really good at inducing magnetic fields and thus electrical currents. So let's say my projectile was just a coil. That's all it was, a coil that would fit down my barrel and it would be connected end to end. So it would be a continuous coil. If I were to run a sine wave through my coils, I would create a magnetic field. That changing magnetic field would induce a current into the projectile, which would then produce a magnetic field that would oppose the original magnetic field, pushing it out. I know that sounds weird. It is kind of weird. You can think about it in a simpler way. How about instead of having a projectile be a coil that comes back in on itself, how about it's just a rod of copper? Now, if I have a copper rod and I have changing magnetic fields around it, it's going to induce current just the same way as it would any coil that system becomes much more akin to a common science demonstration. 
people will uh, take copper pipes and then they'll drop a magnet through it, but it doesn't fall at the full speed. We all know that copper is not ferromagnetic, magnets don't stick to it, but it still has an effect. They still interact with each other. When you drop a, uh, when you drop a permanent magnet through a copper pipe, it induces eddy currents into the copper which oppose the magnet. I mean, it slows it down. It doesn't fall at the speed of gravity. So what I'm suggesting is use a copper projectile instead of a steel one and don't try and use ferromagnetism to pull the projectile forward. Use eddy currents to push it forward. That enables you to do this and that also solves another problem which I haven't brought up yet. I said that the inductance of the system was incredibly important in order to manipulate this time constant. But if I take a, a air core coil and I stick a, um, a steel center in it, that's going to dramatically change the inductance. So if I have a projectile that's ferromagnetic and moving through it, the inductance of everything is going to be changing all the time. That doesn't work. But if it's just a copper core, it's not going to affect the inductance, which means that this will remain constant. So yeah, that's my second suggestion. Don't use ferromagnetic projectiles, use copper projectiles. Or you could also use silver, which has a lower resistance than copper, and then it'd be, you know, it'd be like a werewolf gun with the silver bullet, but that's also really expensive, so probably don't do that. So not only would copper allow for this system to work, but it wouldn't have that inherent upper limit like ferromagnetic projectiles do uh, due to saturation. When you're using any currents as your source, that becomes comparable to how AC motors work, asynchronous AC motors. They're doing the same kind of thing. You'll see that the core of an AC motor is a copper squirrel cage. It's a very similar idea and those are really efficient. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much all I have to say. So my first suggestion is one, do use capacitors and be very careful to manipulate your inductance of your coil to work with the capacitor to create a proper period length of your oscillation. That's one. And two is use copper projectiles so that you can rely on the force of eddy currents to propel your projectile as opposed to the ferromagnetism, which is inherently limited. I think that can bring us closer to a truly efficient coil gun. So again, in the future, when I do get an oscilloscope, I will return to this project. I love quail guns. It's such a beautiful system that I really want to see work. I also feel bad about this, honestly. Like I've seen how many of you are so engaged with this project and want to see it come to fruition. I do too, um, but I just, I'm just not capable of doing it right now. I do think that the most common comment I get on any video is just asking about when you'll see more coil gun stuff. So I wasn't super excited to make this, but I do feel that it had to be done. And I also expect that you'll understand. Sometimes you just gotta put away a project and come back to it later. This has been kind of weighing on me and it feels good to get this off my chest. So I hope you're not too mad at me. Hopefully you did get something out of this, talking about the theory. This is all super interesting. I hope you feel the same way. If you do want to support me, my work, my projects, and help get me to a point where I can get a nice oscilloscope, you can do so via my Patreon. I'll also say that I'm toying with the idea of making a different kind of electric projectile weapon. Um, this wouldn't be directly using magnetism like a coil gun is. Instead, it would be using motors and flywheels, kind of like a souped up electric Nerf gun. I'm thinking that that would be pretty fun and not quite as mentally painful as this. But anyways, that's all I have for now. Have a wonderful day. Bye.